Okay, we'll now call to order the uh, Reno City Planning Commission meeting of December 8th, 2022. Uh, can we uh, move to agenda item number one, which is the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, Commissioner Johnson, will you lead us in the pledge? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Uh, great, thank you. Can we do a roll call, please? J.D. Draculich. Here. Harris Armstrong is absent. Peter Gower. Here. Mark Johnson. Here. Arthur Munoz. Here. Sylvia Villanueva is absent. Alex Felto. Here. We have a quorum. <clears throat> Okay, we'll move to agenda item number three, which is public comment. Uh, we'll open up public comment. This item is for either public comment on any action item or for any general public comment. Uh, Michelle, do we have any requests to speak forms? Okay, before we start with public comment, let me just read this into the record. It should be noted for those in the audience that comments are to be addressed to the Planning Commission as a whole. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the Planning Commission agenda. Please note that the Planning Commission may not take action upon any matter not agendized for possible action on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you are an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Lastly, while in this room, please be respectful. Warnings will be issued by the presiding officer if there is disruptive behavior and you will be asked to leave chambers if the behavior continues. On that, um, we did receive um, correspondence that was general in nature and not specific to any items on this agenda. Those were forwarded to the Planning Commission and have been entered into the record. Um, I did not receive any request to speak forms, and I don't believe we have anybody um, in the Zoom meeting that wishes to make public comment at this time. Great, thank you. Would anyone in the public like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will close public comment. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number four, which is approval of the minutes. Mr. Sorry. Chair, we're going to make a motion for approval of the minutes. Is, is that for item 4.1, October 19th, 2022? Correct. Perfect. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Commissioner Dracula, I second. Sweet. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Commissioner Gower abstained and was not at that meeting. Commissioner Johnson, I abstained for that meeting as well. Okay, that means three votes in favor, so the motion carries. We'll move to item 4.2. I'll entertain a motion for approval of uh, the minutes for November 2nd, 2022. Commissioner Munoz, so I move to approve the minutes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Commissioner Dracula, I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, we'll move to now to... Um, Agenda item number five, which is appreciation of Ed Hawkins and Kathleen Taylor for the years of service in the Reno City Planning Commission. Uh, Councilwoman Taylor is not here, but I see Commissioner uh, Ed Hawkins. Um, would you please come up to the podium? Long time no see. Good to see you, sir. Thank <laughs> you for is, coming up. We put this off for two and a half years and finally we get something out of it. I've had a great run, been with the uh, city 17 years, volunteering for all the different uh, forest recent division, four years here with you guys, and uh, what was, oh, six years on the NAB out there. So I'm about 17 years playing around with City of Reno and having a good time. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We, we do have a, uh, an award for you, which I'll give you in a, a second. Um, but I want to say I appreciated when I first got on the commission, uh, I was lucky enough to sit right next to you, and I learned a lot from you, and I always appreciated your input. Uh, you know, there's a lot of really smart people on here, but it was really great hearing your perspective, things from the environment. I remember we had a very contentious project where you were bringing some really good insight on some ADA access issues. It was a university project, but I, I just appreciated every, all the input and all the time uh, you put on the commission, and I, I certainly learned from it. So thank you very much. Mm. Anyone else in the commission would like to anything? Nice to see you again, Ed. 
Glad nice to know you too. Well. Definitely enjoyed the time you were here. Glad that you finally get to stand before us and get recognized. Doing my for typical Santa. <laughs> I do. It is that uh, it is that time, time of, year. of year. So if we were doing it in in February, you would look a little bit different. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks again, Ed. Ed, you're a great just advocate and supporter of city of Reno, particularly the North Valley. So you're a great representative of Ward 4, and I know I really appreciated serving with you for the four and a half years that you were on the commission and just was honored to be able to sit next with you, Nick, sit next to you and, um, you know, share in the decision-making process. I know you always took it very seriously and your role on the commission very seriously. Um, and I want to let you know that I have not worn a blazer to planning commission since you have been on here and I wore it particularly for you tonight. So it's good to see you again. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I'm going to step down and present this to you. Me too. Thanks. Thanks again. Have a great one. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, move to agenda item number six which is public hearings portion of our agenda. Uh, agenda we'll open up agenda item 6.1, which is case number LDC 23-00022, uh, Golden Valley Commerce Center Zoning Map Amendment. Good evening for the record. Mike Rayleigh with Christie Corporation here representing uh, Stan Lucas. Also with me is Don Smith with <laughs> Project 1, the, the project applicant. So oh, I'm using the wrong controller. Sorry about that. So this is a zoning map amendment request to rezone 6.08 acres from mixed-use suburban to industrial commercial. Uh, the project, you, I know you've seen a lot of these, is up in the North Virginia corridor. This one is actually on the south side of Golden Valley Road, uh, just west of Virginia Street. So if you look at where the, where the red roofs are there in the area, that's red roof storage that fronts along Virginia Street. Golden Valley Road separates the project site from that. And then we have a rail spur um, to the south of us. Uh, the project site is currently vacant. This, this shows that, that rail spur. If, if you're looking for, that's taken from Golden Valley Road, looking over towards the propane tank farm that adjoins the site. A couple more pictures. They're looking back the other way. Um, so the project site is master planned industrial. This was part of the, when the reimagined Reno master plan was adopted, the entire area was redesignated as industrial. We're proposing to go to IC. As you can see, the, the mixed uh, suburban, the mixed use that surrounds us, uh, that is all non-complying with the current master plan designation. So it's actually in the city's long-term plan to go in and rezone everything um, either to IC or industrial. Uh, we chose IC just given the proximity to, to residential uses there to the south. It's, a, it's less intense than the industrial zoning that would also be conforming with the master plan. Um, like I mentioned, this does bring the site into conformance with the, the current master plan. This request tonight does not permit any new development. We'll be required to come back before this board with, at a minimum, a major site plan review for residential adjacency before anything can be constructed. Um, it is consistent with other recent changes that have occurred in the corridor. Um, and like I said, uh, it really doesn't grant an entitlement to construct anything tonight. Um, I, Leah had mentioned that she had one call on this and they were concerned about building heights. So I wanted to point out that the, the current MS zoning, um, the IC that's being proposed is much more restrictive in terms of building heights than what could be done currently. Um, so with that, I'm going to be short and sweet and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. We have a presentation from the city side. We do. Thanks, we Leah. do. Good evening, members of the commission. For the record, Leah Brock, assistant planner with the city of Reno Development Services. Uh, this evening, I'm gonna present three applications to you. This is the first of them. So this is the application for the zoning map amendment for the Golden Valley Commerce Center.
forgive me while I situate myself here. I have new glasses, so I got to make sure I can see everything. <laughs> the 6.0 acre site is located south of the intersection of North Virginia Street and West Golden Valley Road. It is north of the railroad track corridor there and approximately 750 feet south of the U.S. Highway 395 exit, 370, exit 73 northbound off ramp. Today's request is a zoning map amendment requesting that the parcel be changed from mixed use suburban to industrial commercial. As Mr. Raley stated, the key issue with this is conformance with the master plan land use designation of industrial. Um, here you can see the master plan land use designation list and the conforming base districts, starting with industrial, industrial, commercial, and moving up through those other ones listed there. MS uh, is not on that list. As Mr. Raley stated during the Reimagine Reno master plan amendment in 2017, this whole entire area was designated under the master plan land use designation of industrial. Everything around it is Everything that is currently there is still in the mixed use suburban zoning district. Um, but it's worth noting here that the second phase of the comprehensive zoning update consists of a review and reconciliation process for these, these kind of inconsistencies. However, staff will be looking at this on a neighborhood basis spanning several years. So in the meantime, the new code does allow for applicants to apply for these zoning map amendments, bringing non-conforming zoning districts into conformance with the master plan land use designation at no cost. In other words, the city is encouraging these sort of zoning map amendments. So again, um, this is a comparison of uses within the current MS zoning district and the IC zoning district. As you can see, the IC zoning district is actually more restrictive than the existing MS zoning district, and that's because it does allow for, for some more extensive uses. But that is consistent with the current development that's in the area, which is mostly legal nonconforming anyways. Um, Due to the residential adjacency standards, a site plan review will be required prior to any development of this property. So again, as Mr. Raley said, this is not an application for any kind of development. When they do proceed to this next stage of developing this property, it will have to come back um, either for an administrative review or to this body for a site plan review or a major site plan review, depending upon what they're going to do. The project was reviewed by various city divisions and partner agencies. The November Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting was canceled. However, they did receive a copy of the application and we did not receive any comments from them. We also did not receive any official comments from the public. I did get a couple of phone calls asking about development of the process, uh, development of the parcel. And because we're not at the stage for development yet, I just explained this was simply a, a request for a zoning map amendment. Um, on the board are the findings for zoning map amendments. Staff can make these findings and does recommend approval of this project. That concludes my presentation. The recommended motion is on the board. And of course, I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to the commission for disclosures. We'll start with Commissioner Gower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No disclosures. Uh, Commissioner Munoz, no disclosures. I am familiar with the area. Commissioner Drakovich, I'm familiar with the site. Commissioner Johnson, no disclosures. Uh, Commissioner Velto, no disclosures. Uh, we'll now move to public comments. Uh, we'll open up public comment. Do we have any request to speak forms? I believe you have request to speak forms in front of you. Oh. And we also have somebody on Zoom. I don't know if she wanted to speak on this item. She's, she has her hand written or raised. So do you want to take that one first? Or? Yeah, we'll take her or take them first. Tracy? Tracy, can you hear us? I don't know if Tracy's there. 
You're muted. Can you hear us? Um, Tracy's still muted, so I don't know okay. if Tracy wants to make public comment. Do you want to just move to the public comment cards and then we'll... Sure. Uh, okay. We'll start with Gail Wilson. Hello, this is my first time doing this. So um, my name is Gail Wilson. I live at 831 West Golden Valley Road right up the street from where this is planned. Um, have lived there for 23 years and that's been a big open lot. Um, some of the questions that we, I and my neighbors have about that is uh, about what's going to be built there. And I understand from what's been said today is we have no way of knowing. So, um, and it seems like there's there's no way to uh, object if it was part of the master planning that the zoning changes. So I appreciated seeing the difference between the MS zoning and the, indust the industrial uh, commercial zoning. Uh, the one thing that one of the things that we're concerned about is the height of the building, so we understand that this would limit it to three stories, which I think is good. Um, but I also saw that it would allow a tow yard, which I would hope that we would be able to have a chance to object to something like that when the, when the process gets there. We in the North Valleys would really like to see <laughs> less um, warehouses and more uh, smaller businesses because we we really need those and uh, where my house is located across from the railroad tracks the same railroad tracks that go around the bend there um, they put the chewy warehouse which is 800,000 square feet and probably I guess three stories but it's completely blocked our view. It's made a lot of noise. We've had a lot of objections. We have gotten them to stop uh, the backup beepers all the time, which were driving us all crazy. And we also uh, are working on getting the lights pollution from because it just shines in our back windows. So um, I have a friend here who is lives across the railroad tracks on Fowler for this um, parcel. And she's seen what we've gone through on with the Chewy warehouse. And, you know, I am concerned for her, my neighbor, and what else is gonna, she's gonna see across those tracks that is gonna annoy her with lights and noise and trucks and, um, a lot of uh, a lot more. Um, we need the infrastructure in the North Valleys. We're just inundated with cars and trucks, and it's getting very snarled up there. So I guess I'm out of time. But thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Barbara Welsh. Good evening. I'm Barbara Welsh. I live at 7770 Fowler Avenue, and I'm Gail's friend. And so I would be looking directly at this project. And some of my concerns are the same as Gail's, but also I'm concerned about crime in the neighborhood. If you're going to put like a tow yard or a junkyard in there, that would not be appealing to the area. The infrastructure, we need better infrastructure out there. Um, I'm concerned about the density. I know there is a height requirement on the new zoning amendment, and that would be great. But then we look at the monstrosities of warehouses out there, 
and if they're three stories, it would block everybody's view. I am very, very concerned about our neighborhoods. We, I feel like the North Valleys, everything that the city doesn't want or it doesn't want in the South area, it gets put in the North Valleys, and I'm getting kind of tired of it. So I would like to see, you know, we had talked earlier about the Reno Transit Corridor, which I guess was part of the master plan. And I was thinking, well, if we had rapid transit in there, that would be great going up and down Virginia Street there up to, to Stead. But that hasn't happened. Transportation is horrible with Reno Transit, um, the busing system. Um, I'm just very concerned. I, I feel like the people in North Rallies have gotten the brunt in of just a lot of warehouses and traffic and crime. And the city really haven't, hasn't listened to us. So um, that's pretty much all I have to say. I'd like to know more about the development, what's going to go in there before anything happens. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. I think that's it for public comment. Um, I did not receive any request. I'm sorry, any um, correspondence <coughs> on this item. No voicemails were received. Great, thank you. Would anyone else in the public like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public comment, come back to the commission for questions. Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Leah, can I ask just a couple of questions? Can you? Yes. Just start now. Since you're going to be in front of us three more times, two more times after this, we'll just get yeah. along. So I guess the first question I have, you mentioned that any, any development that's going to be there is going to require some type of entitlement process, whether it comes all the way here. Um, under the IC zoning, is that the same if the zoning doesn't change? It is the same if the zoning doesn't change. Site plan reviews are required for any development that's within 150 feet of a residential zoning district. Okay. So that's not going to change one way or another. Okay. And then I guess the second question, and, and maybe this is tied to the, the site and the site location, as was pointed out there, um, with the separation of the train tracks and everything from there. I guess one of the things we often hear when these projects are coming up is a question about the, the noticing radius. And I know that it's set and that we do it, but I'm maybe I'm wondering how far is that going to extend into the adjacent neighborhood? Just thinking about you know some of the co comments that we heard this evening, um, obviously there will be a notice posted on the site, but it's always helpful when you get the card in the mail if you're, especially the those that would be you know, looking out over the site. So has there been, I guess, can you in looking at the site or have any idea of how, you know, how far is that actually going to go? Is it just going to be the people who immediately, you know, back up to the train area or is it going to come a little bit further into that neighborhood? So the noticing um, area is 750 feet from the property boundary lines or if it's not 30 properties, then they'll continue to extend that until it reaches 30 properties. So in this particular case, I'm going to back up under one of my slides here, and I can kind of give you a rough idea. I appreciate that. So it, it, gets, it gets challenging after a while to hear that and then just see what, what people are asking for. So. Yes. And let me see if I can get one. So maybe this is the best slide for that. That railroad corridor that you see right there is 200 feet. So imagine that plus another 550 feet beyond that. So it probably extends. I realize I don't have a pointer that's going to work for you guys here. Yeah, you can use the mouse. I can use the mouse. So it's probably going to extend out into this range right here. And this will be everybody that will be noticed. And we will make sure that that posted notice that's on the property is in a place that's visible to anybody driving down Golden Valley Road here, too, as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Answers my question. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Commissioner Munoz? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we know I scream the same thing every meeting about uh, traffic and about all the things that we're dealing with up there. Um, and this was an easy, um, it, this was easy for me to make the findings 
Um, and knowing at this point we're not burdening uh, with uh, how many houses we'd be able to put on that property as it is it sits right now. So the um, the changing to IC was was it just made sense for me and the way it fits the area. Um, it just I think it's the right way to go. I do have some concerns and I do understand what the uh, neighbors are going to be dealing with and what's coming in there and I'm assuming because of everything that's on that corridor it will be some type of warehouse um, and hopefully when we get closer to that and that comes in we can the discussions can turn more towards something uh, commercial can be used by the residents up there is my goal so we won't know till we get there unfortunately but um, I don't I don't see any issues with this as it stands with that too yeah, Mr. Sure. Chair, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion. And I, I think I appreciate Mr. Munoz's comments. And I think the, the one thing that I appreciated and, and the applicant mentioned it is that this is not the most intense zoning. Uh, the IC allows, you know, it keeps it a little bit smaller. And we've seen several IC projects that are actually more of a, you know, a smaller level development. So potentially that could be what we have here. So uh, with that said, uh, in the case of LDC 23-00022, Golden Valley Commerce Center Zoning Map Amendment, based upon compliance with the applicable findings, I move to recommend that City Council approve the Zoning Map Amendment by ordinance, and I can make all of the findings. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Manuels, I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Then the motion carries unanimously. Good luck. We'll now move to agenda item 6.2, which is case number LDC 23-00012, Silver Hills Water Tanks. Good evening. Once again, Welcome for the record, back. Mike Mike Rayleigh with Christie Corporation here representing Lifestyle Homes. Also with me is Bob Listener uh, with Lifestyle Homes. <laughs> I think my presentation's... There we go. Yeah. So this is a major site plan review request to allow for cuts greater than 20 feet, <clears throat> excuse me, fills greater than 10 feet in support of two new water tanks that will serve the Silver Hills project, which was approved as a specific plan in unincorporated Washoe County. Um, the first phase of Silver Hills was approved. Um, this thing is. All, oh, that's exactly what it is. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Silver Hills, uh, obviously the large parcels that you see there, uh, a little over 700 acres, that's the specific plan. And I'm going to use the pointer here. Phase one of Silver Hills in fact, was approved in this area right here along Red Rock Road. And the, the tank site is actually up here, the city of Reno uh, corporate boundaries right there. So the tank site is in the city of Reno. The, the project is in unincorporated Washoe County. So there was some, initially some confusion about why are we at the city for a county project, that's why. And then as you see here, uh, Washoe County operates a, a gravel pit um, aggregate operation right there next to where the water tank site is. So as I mentioned, the site is currently vacant. There's some views uh, taken from, kind of generally speaking, there's a, a Jeep trail that runs behind the, uh, the aggregate pit and that's where those pictures were taken from. Um, this is the overall Silver Hills land use plan, just to give you an idea of what that project is. It's a mix of, <laughs> of residential, public facility, parks, open space. Um, there's even some, some limited commercial allowed. It's going to incorporate an agri-hood, so kind of, a, kind of a large master plan community. Um, so the major site plan review would allow for the grading that's associated with the tanks, and I'll elaborate that on that a little bit more here in the next slide. Um, the tanks will be owned and operated by Trek Mills Water Authority, and generally serve the specific hill specific plan. Um, the site plan review will also allow for the establishment of a utility use at, along with the cuts and fills that I mentioned earlier. There's actually two tanks, two 960,000 gallon tanks that are 74 feet in diameter and 32 feet in height. Um, as you recall, maybe uh, recently the, the Canyons water tanks that came in, the Tumwa's new standard is to do two tanks to allow for redundancy and a backup supply should one of the tanks have to come out of service. Um, so this is the site plan, um, and what I think is, is really important is 
normally site or water tanks are really kind of up on the side of a, of a ridge. They they're, require a lot of grading. Um, what this shows are the areas that you see in blue and red are the only areas that trigger the uh, site plan review. So the very limited grading, it's actually a great location for water tank. It's over a mile from Red Rock Road. You can't really see it from anything other than within Silver Hills itself. And so you see the red there behind the tanks is cut. The blue is filled. So it's very limited for a water tank. In fact, it's much less grading than, than the majority of Tomo water tanks that we see in the region. So the tank will be accessed by a 20-foot paved road that extends through Silver Hills to Red Rock Road. Um, they'll be located for security purposes between a six-foot vinyl chain link gate or um, fence with the gate. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice tonight. They will be painted kind of the standard Tumwa neutral colors. I've got some examples later on to, so you can see what the color of the tanks will be. Um, as I mentioned, given the distance from any surrounding development, they really are uh, hidden. And then once you get up there, they're actually located right next to the aggregate mine, which I would argue has a much greater visual impact than what the tanks will. Um, so these are some, some similar tanks, uh, Tomo tanks, as you can see the colors, they're, they're painted to blend with the natural environment. Um, and with that, I, I am done, but I would like to, to mention, I was, the question was posed to me that this site is actually zoned open space. And, you know, whenever you're proposing any kind of development in open space, what's, what's the benefit to the public? Um, it is private open space. I want to mention the, pro the property is privately owned. But this, these tanks are necessary for Silver Hills. And I think this, the benefits that Silver Hills will bring in terms of public benefits far outweigh what, what would be offered on this site next to the gravel pit. Um, and that includes a comprehensive trail network, um, the backbone trail system within Silver Hills is required to be constructed with the first phase. So it won't be just trails within that first phase, it's through the entire project, connecting Silver Hill, Silver Knowles Park all the way into the BLM, BLM lands, equestrian access, that sort of thing, that's with phase one. There will also be two public um, trailheads within Silver Hills, the first of which is constructed with the first phase that will include uh, equestrian access, horse trailer parking, um, and access out to the public lands. There's a 10, 10 acres of community park required within Silver Hills, and that um, does not include any pocket parks like what you see within phase one. So that's in addition to that. Um, also, I think most importantly, there's 152 acres of dedicated open space that will come with Silver Hills that, you know, like I say, this project can't move forward without those tanks. Um, also, there's a, an equestrian and pedestrian underpass under Red Rock Road that allows people that are on the other side, on the east side of Red Rock, to get through and out to the public lands. That will be constructed with Phase 1. Um, there's a 20-acre public facility reservation in the specific plan for a school site, potentially other community buildings, such as a library, that sort of thing, that's reserved in the specific plan. Um, and all those amenities are open to the general public. Those are public amenities that Silver Hills will bring. And one thing that I think is another important thing, there's no essentially no water system out there now for uh, wildland fire protection. So this will be a huge benefit for fire protection in the area as well. So I think those benefits really do counteract any public benefit that would be lost from disturbing open areas that are zoned open space with the water tanks. So just want to thought I'd add that. Available for questions. Thank you so much. Leah, do we have a presentation? Yes, I do. For the record, again, Leah Brock, Assistant Planner with City of Reno Development Services. Second application of the night here is the Silver Hills Water Tank ma uh, Major Site Plan Review. The subject five-acre site is located approximately 1.33 miles northwest of the intersection of Silver Nose Boulevard and Red Rock Road. Um, because this map doesn't show much of anything other than just um, <laughs> uh, some dirt roads there, I did want to point out that, and let's see if I can do this, can I do it with the mouse? Oh. Hey, Michelle, how do I get my animations to work here with the pointer? Okay. Gotcha. Okay, let's see if this one works. I just wanted to point out that 
over here in that box right there gives you a better idea of where that location is um, in relation to Reno. It's way up in the north, north, west portion. And again, as Mr. Raley pointed out, uh, there's kind of a, a section there that's incorporated and then there's some unincorporated areas there as well. So it is a five acre site and this is a request for a major site plan review to allow cuts greater than 20 feet and fills greater than 10 feet associated with the placement of these two new water tanks and the associated road coming in, access road. The subject site is located in the parks, greenways and open space zoning district. Um, minor utilities are allowed by right within this zoning district because they do provide a public benefit. As uh, Mr. really said, I won't repeat all of the same public benefits that he repeated. To give you a little bit of background, the Silver Hill specific plan was approved by Washoe County Board of Commissioners in 2019, and it allows for up to 1,872 single family dwelling units. It also includes parks, trails, public facilities, and a limited amount of commercial uses. The Silver Hills Village One tentative map was approved in 2021 and includes 358 single family dwelling units. The subject request today will provide the required infrastructure necessary to support that development. Key issues involved in this request are overall site design, grading hillside development, and natural resource protection, and public utilities and infrastructure. The proposed tanks will be 74 feet in diameter and approximately 32 feet in height. The access road will encircle the tanks to provide for maintenance. Site security will include a maintenance gate and a six foot vinyl coated chain link fence with barbed wire. The proposed project will mitigate environmental degradation and utilize grading practices intended to minimize visibility and scarring. Disturbed areas will be revegetated with natural plant material. Security fencing and water tanks and all the riprap used will be earth tone, brown color, and blend in with the natural environment. Disturbed slopes will be contoured to match the natural terrain. The water tanks will be located approximately one mile from the Red Rock Road and approximately one mile from any existing residents. And as Mr. Raley pointed out, the existing gravel pit, pit to the east will further screen the tanks from any view. It is anticipated that the placement of these water tanks will have little to no visual impact. Agency comments were received and incorporated into the analysis. The November, November Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting was canceled. However, they did receive a copy of this application and staff did not receive any public comments from NAB or from the public associated with this. The major site plan review findings are on the board for your consideration. Again, this use is allowed by right in the PGOS zoning district and this request is limited to the appropriateness of the site grading. Staff does recommend approval subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come back to the commission for disclosures. Start with Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Johnson, no disclosures. Commissioner Draculich, no disclosures. Commissioner Moon is familiar with the area. Commissioner Gower, corresponded with the applicant's representative. Okay, Commissioner Velton, no disclosures. Uh, we'll now move to open up public comments. Do we have any requests to speak forms? Did not receive any requests to speak forms. No correspondence and no voicemails were received. And it doesn't appear that anyone in Zoom wishes to make public comments, so. Okay, would anyone in the public like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll... would you like to speak on this item? Oh, you can absolutely just ask that you fill out a form uh, after you speak, please. Sure. Again, Gail Wilson, um, Golden Valley Road. This is, of course, is not you know directly around my neighborhood, but uh, I have friends that live up there, and um, so I have a question about. First of all, where's the water co coming from? that goes in those tanks? Is that a aquifer? We're not able to answer your questions, but if you okay. were to ask some questions, we'll consider them in our deliberation. Okay. 
Um, just curious because of the water problems that we've been having up there, you know, um, with Lemon Valley flooding and just, uh, you know, Silver Lake and all of that. But um, so my question is kind of generally about how do we as the public find out about these besides seeing the post on the road, which is how we found out about this other thing, um, or if we're directly in the 750 foot zone or whatever, I have gone on uh, websites, on city websites and so forth, and um, it's very difficult to find out when you, uh, either by a parcel number or uh, by the um, LCD number or whatever, to actually find out what's planned for a particular place. So um, it, it's, not, it's not really that user friendly. And um, so when we have questions about something like this, like I'd like to find out more about this project, which I didn't know about, um, how, where, my question is how do we go find out more about that? And, um, um, and how, uh, you know, besides coming to meetings and stuff and hearing the, um, the presentation, um, how do we know when things are going to happen? And my general comment about this particular project for building, you know, 2,000 homes or whatever it is, is again, <laughs> is infrastructure. We, our roads are just a mess. I mean, they are so crowded, and all the trucks from all of those uh, warehouses that are being built are tearing up the roads. I mean, there are potholes that are, you know, you could drive a truck through. And it's very, uh, the, just the traffic jams are just getting, it's getting very dangerous. And, and um, you know, it's, it's just, the infrastructure needs to be in place when these things are built. I appreciate that the water is at least going to be available for this, but we've had so many houses and so many um, uh, warehouses built, and nothing has been done to alleviate the traffic jams. And so that's a big concern of ours. So. Thank you for your comments. Gail, can you fill out a comment card, please? Thank you. Great. Would anyone else like to speak? OK. Seeing none, we will close public comment. Come back to the commission for questions. Commissioner Gellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to the, um, the Ms. Wilson's point about getting information at Leah, it looked like you may have shared some information um, in terms of how she can get information, but is that something that we can we can just talk about for a minute, Jason or Leah, to the public who may have similar questions of kind of a quick overview of how the public can get information about projects? Absolutely. Uh, Jason Garcia Labu, planning manager for the record. Um, there's several different avenues. Um, when we get new projects that are applied for, uh, we have them at an intake cycle, and typically there is a what we call DRM, or uh, an email blast of the new projects that come in. So anybody interested can get signed up for that. In addition to that, on our website, we actually have a mapping feature uh, for those people that don't necessarily know about certain projects or other things, and they can use that to uh, navigate uh, map wise to the different projects so we have that labeled on there so those are tools and we'll definitely follow up with you for a little more information on that as well but anybody in our public feel free to reach out to our uh, development services department we have a planner of the day that can connect you with current projects and get you on the list and everything so and Jason to get on that development review memo or the DRM um, outreach is that Pretty intuitive if you go to the City Arena website or is that something that they should just contact community development directly? 
Um, you can go to our development, development serv services. Sorry. You can go to development services, and uh, it'll have links to that information. But if there's any questions whatsoever, there's an email link on our main page that goes to that pod. So you don't even have to look for it. We can help you get there. But they do have separate. Um, that mapping feature also has like a list of the most recent projects um, of everything that comes through. And that's not just stuff that comes to this planning commission. That's also administrative projects and other things that come through our department. It's everything through our department. So very helpful tool. More information than you probably want to know. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a, another question, if I could, following up on um, Ms. Wilson's question about the water source. Um, and then, Mike, if you or Mike, if you can answer that, and then also I was curious about the comment that you made about the um, water availability for uh, wildfire protection right. too, and that, how that works. Sure. Once again, for the record, Mike Ray, the Christie Corporation. So this, these tanks are were basically Tumwas extending their municipal service, their municipal system out to the site. Um, Lifestyle Homes is required to dedicate water rights to serve all the new development. So those will be dedicated to Tumwa. Um, so it's Tumwa water that that's essentially going to be used. Um, as far as the the fire suppression, right now there is no there there's no hydrants out there at all. The in the in the homes <coughs> further to these, the majority of those are on wells. Um, so this and there's really nowhere to fill tender trucks or anything like that. So this will be a huge improvement in terms of fire protection in the area because you'll have that municipal water system in place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I think this is probably a question for Jason because it's a little bit probably maybe project, less project specific in in looking at this, and I think Mike touched on it at the very beginning of his presentation, that we're basically looking at a project that's supporting a development in Washoe County rather than the city of Reno, um, which immediately got me thinking, well, how, how is that possible? And so I, I looked out at the, you know, the, the parcel ownership that's out there, and, or not so much ownership, but the, the boundaries between the city of Reno and, and Washoe County in that area. And the, this area is almost an island of the city of Reno surrounded by Washoe County, as opposed to what we've often seen here where there's a Washoe County that's surrounded by Reno and it's in our sphere of influence and, and therefore we're viewing it. Here it seems, it, and maybe this is just a general question, is there a process or a, you know, an appetite for some of this, which is all essentially zoned parks, greenway, and open space, to have that reverted back to the county since it's surrounded by the county and have, you know, in other words, going back to the very same question of why are we looking at something that's based on a housing development that we never saw? So three, you know, 2,000, 3,000 homes that are out there that were looked at regionally. Now, you know, there's obviously, you know, some tie to the city of Reno, but it's almost the reverse of what we're seeing. So I'm just wondering if even when the city was looking at that, was there not a conversation with the county about, hey, why, you know, is there is there reason to convert some of this back to the county and let this fall under your jurisdiction? <coughs> Jason Garcia Lavu, planning manager for the record. Um, very good points. Very good questions. Um, at this point, um, that's more of a prog programmatic um, discussion, uh, bigger picture discussion. Um, just to kind of go back to what both the agent as well as Leah brought up. In this case, the way that we took in the application. Uh, we look at it as a by right type use. Um, it's located under our permitting. And so uh, essentially the grading portion is what triggered this application through this process. Now that being said, um, we do understand where it's located. It's on in that area that has a large amount of land that's um, in the county. Um, and there's also um, the whole conversation, as you brought up, uh, regarding sphere and changing that potential boundary. Um, at this point, um, we haven't had that conversation in that area uh, on that big, big bigger, bigger picture issue. Um, but that is definitely something as we look at uh, potential uh, programs, annexations, fear of influence, and that interface between the county as well as the city, um, whether or not those should be um, in the purview or area um, that we look at. Um, just to clarify for people that don't necessarily know um, the differences of all the language I just used, 
Um, the city of Reno, when we get projects in and they're in that sphere of influence, that sphere of influence, that essentially we look at that as a area that could potentially be annexed in the future. And within those areas, if it's in a sphere of influence, um, typically applications will come through our department. So you'll see applications on the planning side or sometimes building permit side um, in those areas that we look at even though it's in Washoe County. So that's what we're kind of discussing here. Um, this is, you know, through our process, it's in, in the city limits, it has a city zoning, uh, but some of those neighboring areas like the development that was approved, uh, all that permitting and whatnot was done through Washoe County. So it's kind of funky in this mix because this project that we're talking about today for those tanks supports the development in Washoe County. So hopefully that answers some of the questions, but to your question, um, we haven't really had those conversations at this point. So, so I guess where I'm, what I'm hearing, and maybe it's a discussion at a future date, is is looking at the opposite of the annexation and looking at at areas that don't make sense necessarily to be part of the city of Reno because it's not going to be developed. And I guess maybe if if Mr. Chair just might to ask you a question because obviously, you know, the development that's around there. Was there ever any conversation? Uh, with the uh, you know the, the owner of the adjacent developments as to the mix between Washoe County and Reno out there in terms of looking at, at maybe you know one way or the other with any of that. Once again, for the record, Mike really there actually has been some discussions. Um, obviously, to take stuff in and out of the sphere of influence, it, it's it's a regional process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the county is in the process of updating their area plans. We've, we've brought it up as part of that. Obviously, Lifestyle Homes is one of the, the largest landowners out in that area with their Woodland Village project in Cold Springs. Um, Evans Ranch, which is actually in the city of Reno, further further out Red Rock. So we, we've looked at some of that in terms of providing services. Who, does it doesn't make sense to be in the city. Does it doesn't make sense to be in the county. And I, I would say that on a regional level, it's it's being looked at. But like Jason mentioned, it's, it's very in the very early stages. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate okay. that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Munoz. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. This is going to be for you again. Um, help me understand why put this in the parks and green greenway space and not in the development that's already approved. In order to get proper pressure zones, when I, so we've worked with Tumwater to determine where those tanks will be. And, and to be honest with you, this is not necessarily just solely to serve Silver Hills. It will have other public benefit down the line. Um, but in order to really best serve that area, that's where those tanks need to go. Make sure that the pressure zones are proper and whatnot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Munoz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 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 Tanks. Based on compliance with the applicable findings, I move to approve the major site plan review subject conditions listed in the staff report, and I can make them. Great, thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Commissioner Draculich, I can second that and can also make all the findings. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Thanks so much. Good luck. Uh, we'll move to agenda item 6.3, which is case number LDC 23 00011, Center for Adaptive Writing. Do we have a presentation from the applicant? Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Hooper, and I am a member of the board for the Center for Adaptive Writing. We'll refer to that as 
car throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, my wife Carolyn and I are retired uh, U.S. Army veterans, and we are also the program directors for the Horsemanship for Heroes program, uh, which is a veterans program at at CAR. Um, I'll be sharing uh, briefing duties with our executive director, Mrs. Nikki Landa, uh, this evening. And, uh, and tonight, what we plan to show you is, first of all, who we are, um, highlight the significance of our mission. Uh, we feel that's pretty important. And the, its impact on a really um, significant and imp significantly important population uh, within our community, a couple of populations, actually. Uh, we'll answer why we're making this uh, conditional use permit request, which is what, it, what the request is, and uh, express our desire to initiate use as, as soon as possible, uh, more so for health and uh, safety reasons. So, here we go. This is the test right here. Let's take a second. Hold on. It should be. Yes. No, it was in the presentation. Thanks. Sorry. I have the flash stick. Would you like to yeah, stick it in there? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I truly, sincerely apologize. Oh, no sorry. worries. No worries. <laughs> Technical difficulties are understandable. <laughs> this is the reason my wife left the Signal Corps after 12 years and became human resources. Because the guys like <laughs> me. <laughs> Who we are. This week's Someone's to Know tell us their goal is to enrich lives through the power of the horse. Using equine assisted learning, they help children and adults with physical and personal development. The Reno nonprofit has been offering its programs for the past 15 years. Meet the team behind the Center for Adaptive Riding. All right, let's go say hi to Tang. Lessons vary depending on the participant. From gentle touches and hellos, to mounting the horse, scooch, good job, and riding. We serve children and adults with physical, cognitive, social, and emotional disabilities. Nikki Landa is an instructor and the executive director of the Center for Adaptive Riding. She says this work is her dream come true. In high school, I did an internship at Marvin Piccolo School. I fell in love with therapeutic writing. She then volunteered for the center, got certified, and now runs the nonprofit. Our biggest program is our therapeutic writing for children and adults with special needs. And lessons look something like this. Good, head still stays up. That is teacher Kay Hooper in the ring. She and her husband Scott are developing special equine assisted classes that will launch in January a program called Horsemanship for Heroes, and it's a veterans program here at the center. Hooper says for he and Kay, it is personal. We are both retired Army veterans, uh, seven <coughs> combat tours between us. Scott says he wants other vets to enjoy the same experiences he has. There's a connection, there's a bond, and I thought, well, well this is really powerful. Nikki, too, has had very powerful experiences. One student in particular named Rhett comes to mind. He started riding when he was four years old, so he's in a wheelchair. You know, he started really timid. His muscles were really tight. That young student is now eight years old. 
to now a new horse, first time riding him, gets the reins, and it's just that confidence and the joy. It's really just priceless. Instructors and participants say development like this is common in equine assisted learning. That's why the Horsemanship for Heroes program is free for veterans and scholarships are available for other lessons. Truly want to continue serving and this is how we see that we can do it. Really just touch lives and provide the opportunity for people to experience what horses give back. Such amazing work. That's the Center good. for Adaptive Riding is off West Hoffaker Lane, right in Reno. They do rely greatly on volunteers and donations to offer these low cost lessons and free to those in need. So for more information on ways you can help or if you want to learn about their services for yourself, check the online version of this story at 2news.com. Okay. Am I driving again or you got it? Okay, thank you. So um, that's who we are and that's what we do. And I think that the power of that video and actually seeing the kids and if you were to get in the arena with the veterans as they're they're dealing with their issues, but they're getting reflected from a horse on, on how their behavior is. It's, it's amazing and it's powerful and it's exciting. We are excited uh, to provide this service here in Reno and to move to a location that uh, has the protective environment that will just make, make it that much better. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Nikki for, uh, for the next few things talking about what we do and our, uh, our site plan. Thank you. I am Nikki Landa. I'm the executive director of the Center for Adaptive Writing. Um, so you kind of got an idea of the different programs and what we do. So our request is for a conditional use permit um, for an establishment of a commercial stable with residential adjacency. So the location is a three and a half acre site. It is, um, it's a Washoe County property, so the zoning is high density rural. It is within the city of Reno sphere of influence, which translates to large lot neighborhood. So this location is off of Del Monte on Bondi Lane. And why we are looking at this property, the biggest draw for us is the indoor riding arena. It's an established facility. It has this beautiful riding arena that will allow us to operate year round, give our participants the ability to progress on their goals um, and continue making those strides. And the location is accessible. That's been a goal of ours um, with traffic in the area increasing. And I'm really just trying to stay within Reno to be able to provide the services for our families and our um, participants. So some photos of the existing conditions on site. You can see it has an indoor arena. It also has a large outdoor arena. Within the indoor arena, there are 12 stalls. And then um, that bottom right-hand photo just past on the other side of the arena is um, some shelters and uh, stalls for the horses as well. And you can see it's beautifully landscaped and has um, trees and shrubs on site. And then it was brought to our attention that the shelters in the rear of the property are encroaching on the property line. So we will take those down. And then within that indoor arena, there is an office slash tack room, as well as a lounge and a restroom, which we would convert the restroom to be ADA accessible. But those are already on site, beautiful facilities. So our site plan, the first thing, um, the horse trailer parking, number one, and then the manure, we will use a Washoe County Waste Management um, dumpster and put it in there and keep it on that side of the property, and they will pick it up once a week. And then number two, that side of the property, the rear, we will put up six foot foot screening as well as landscape. And number three, you can see those horse shelters again, the encroaching on the property line, we will um, disassemble those. We have identified spots for ADA parking as well as other parking and the, it might not show it, but we will meet the city code and have those um, 20 feet from the property line at least. And then the driveway is 24 feet wide and we will um, asphalt that. And I just wanted to include that our current location where we are at, it doesn't have an indoor 
riding arena. That's the biggest draw for this other location. Um, but it, you can see this is an overview of it. So it is in a very residential neighborhood right now. We've had zero complaints from our neighbors. We have little um, impact. Our traffic is very small. We're a small organization. And I do um, an exhibit F of the staff report are two letters of support from those neighbors directly impacted by us. Um, we are also a premier accredited center through PATH International. So that requires requires over 100 standards that we will implement, including um, facility standards as well. And we believe we are compatible usage for this already existing beautiful facility. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott. OK, so on here, you see, a, you see our daily operations. Uh, you know, that, so there's daily care and feeding of the horses uh, twice a day. Actually, we make sure that we have a barn manager that, and a couple of other uh, employees that handle that and a slew of volunteers, which is, which is wonderful about what we do. Uh, programs, when we're in session, uh, five days a week, we are, we are not operating on uh, Sunday and Monday, but obviously the maintenance of the facility and the horses uh, are always going on. Nikki mentioned manure management. That was a concern of one of the neighbors, and uh, we've got that under control. We collect it daily, and then weekly it is shipped out. Um, number of horses, we currently have 11. Three of those are minis. We are uh, planning for 15 to get to fully support our veterans program, and, uh, and that was one of the conditions that the, the staff report uh, highlighted as a maximum number as well. All of our horses have shelters associated with them, and quite frankly, care and management of our horses is the foundation of what we do. So we also have a detailed evacuation plan should any incident occur uh, with fires in Reno, in particular in this area, um, we are ready to execute evacuation with, a, with an on-call list of available trailers. There's minimal traffic to get to the site. Uh, there's, uh, you know, many, a lot of the neighbors are concerned. There's the Kitski circle up there. Typically on a given day, six to eight vehicles on a typical operations day, six to eight vehicles maximum. Uh, parents will bring their children uh, if they're children or their their adult dependents who are get going through the adaptive riding. Veterans will drive uh, to the program and it's executed in a quiet, safe environment and it's done that way on purpose. Uh, so I think there were also some neighbor concerns about traffic, about noise. Um, we oriented our parking spaces so the headlights will all orient in towards ourselves and uh, very conscious of of the neighborhood, but uh, this won't be a place where people will be hanging out and getting in trouble. It's it's really about healing and uh, and therapeutic work. We acknowledge uh, in the staff report that I'm sure Lee is going to provide. There's 21 requirements in there. We acknowledge them. We will do them, uh, execute them. The one thing that that we don't have much control over, though, is uh, the environment in Reno. And so our our number one primary concern is time. Um, as you see, what, what we do, uh, both with the adaptive riding um, for kids and adults and the veterans program, it requires continuous contact to be successful. So anywhere from eight-week programs to 10-week programs, and some of those, and I'll use the veterans for example, is 90 minutes a week, 10 weeks consecutive. When you have to scrap a class because of inclement weather or cancel one or two, it has a significant impact on the individuals receiving the service. This facility is, is perfect. Um, it is safe, it's covered, it's in beautiful condition. And so with that in mind, um, we had, and probably procedurally did this, uh, I'm not exactly sure how, what was the 100% way, but we requested a, an amendment to allow, and we understand that um, precedent has been made that um, initiation of use could begin while the perm after the permits have been applied for, and uh, we are obviously committed to getting all of the permits fulfilled and completed. So um, I'd like to uh, submit for the public record and, and make that official request. I know we cannot ask anything of you here, and you cannot decide this right now, at least for the, the amendment piece of it, 
but we'll, we'll, for the record, also state we're willing to do whatever we need to, to administratively or whatever else, but we can't control contractors and snow and pouring driveways in January or December, and the facility is safe. Um, well, it's through the health department and fire standards are all met and made, but it would be wonderful um, to get there and to get in and operate as soon as possible, uh, preferably next month in January when we relaunch our programs. Um, it's not realistic to get all of those things done. They will all get done, I guarantee that. Uh, but that's just, so that's what's on our mind. And so if you could, I guess we could just submit them to the staff and to go into the public record since the, by the, by the NRS, is that the right way to do that? It's, this is a copy of our request for the amendment. And then does that work? I think we understand. So if you want to keep okay. the presentation. Oh, well, that's great. That's most important that you understand. Okay. <laughs> um, really that's, that is, um, I think that's the key is, uh, is one one thing I'll just say is the parents will bundle their kids up, they'll and we've seen it, and they'll bundle them up and they'll want to get them there. Veterans will bundle up to come and participate because they don't want to miss. But what happens is it degrades the effectiveness of the session, and that therein lies the the, the whole reason why we're actually asking for that exception there. Um, let's see. Aside from that, thank you, in all sincerity. Thanks for the time. Thanks so much. <laughs> Appreciate you. Uh, we'll now move to the commission for disclosures. We'll start with Commissioner. Oh, my apologies. Leah, we would love to hear your presentation. I would. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Again, for the record, Leah Brock, Assistant Planner with the City of Reno Development Services. I am presenting the third application for this evening, which is a conditional use permit for the Center for Adaptive Riding. The 3.5 acre site is located on Bondi Lane, just south of Ranchera and east of Highway 395. The subject site is located within the city of Reno sphere of influence and has a master plan land use designation of large lot neighborhood. The subject site has a Washoe County zoning designation of high density rural, which translates to large lot residential per the Reno Municipal Code. <coughs> The subject 3.5 acre site is comprised of a developed 2.5 acre parcel and an undeveloped one acre parcel. The 2.5 acre parcel is developed with a single family residence and a 15,000 square foot indoor arena with 12 stalls, an office, a lounge, and a tack room. Proposed improvements include converting the indoor arena and accessory buildings to a commercial use. Right now it is considered a residential use. Um, which includes the addition of an ADA-compliant restroom, removing those encroaching structures um, from the rear of the property, adding a paved parking area, uh, and, and screening, the park area, screening the parking area and locating in a minimum of 20 feet from any parcel boundary line, a storage area with a maximum of three horse trailers, one tractor, and the dumpster will be, started, will be stored on the north side of the indoor arena. And all exterior lighting will be brought up and updated to meet current Reno Municipal Code standards. The project will generate a minimal amount of traffic and will have a minimal impact to the neighboring street network. Access to the site will be provided by an existing 24 foot wide driveway, which will be required to be paved to accommodate emergency vehicles. The paved parking and driveway will reduce dust and noise impacts. Minimal impacts are anticipated from the required improvements and limited construction hours of operation will also reduce the impacts to those surrounding properties. Regarding the operations, the hours of operation shall be limited to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week, and all evening commercial activities shall be limited to the indoor arena only. All event, any events with over 50 people on premise shall require a special activity permit, which will be limited to one per year with a maximum of 100 attendees. The number of horses allowed on site shall be limited to a maximum of 15. If the 3.5 acre site is reduced in acreage, the number of horses allowed will be reduced in proportion to that reduction. 
The manure and waste shall be stored in a large dumpster on the north side of the indoor arena and shall be removed by a disposal company a minimum of one time a week. And the applicant shall also provide a, a manure management plan for the commercial enterprise and submit it to Washoe County Health Department for review and approval prior to operation. Surrounding uses include single family on all sides. The nearest residence is approximately 170 feet to the south of the subject site, and that property owner has provided public comments in support of this application. You can see the location of that property with a happy face there. To the north is an existing mature landscape buffer. The mature landscape buffer shall be maintained. Any failure to maintain this buffer will result in the requirement for residential screening improvements along that parcel line. Also, the applicant shall submit a final landscape plan demonstrating evergreen trees planted along the western property line of the 2.5 acre parcel. Those trees will need to be a minimum of eight feet at the time of installation and reach and be of a species which will reach at least 20 feet at maturity. Regarding infrastructure, the site is currently serviced by an on-site well and a residential septic system. Washoe County Health Department will require the installation of a commercial on-site sewage disposal system, which will probably mean that it's going to link to the City of Reno public infrastructure, which actually comes um, right here to this uh, Bondi Acres development right about there. Uh, they will also have to connect to the public water infrastructure or become a public water system. Regarding public safety and welfare, we did not receive any concerns from Reno Fire Department or from code enforcement. And as the applicant stated, they do have an established emergency evacuation plan. Oh, it looks like my map is missing. Well. <laughs> That's the, that's, that's the property that's in favor, and uh, the property that's in opposition is with the X. So what I was trying to, did we do a duplicate? Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Back on. So the applicant did present this project to the Ward 2 Neighborhood Advisory Board on October 18th, 2022. There were concerns raised at that meeting that included adequate infrastructure, traffic, screening, dust and manure control, the emergency evacuation, a loud number of horses. But one of the biggest concerns was allowing a commercial stable to be a permanent use. There was a lot of concern that if the Center for Adaptive Riding did not end up utilizing this property or utilized it for a period of time and then moved on, this would be an entitlement that just allows a commercial stable. So I wanna point out that when we crafted these, these conditions of approval, we tried to craft them for a commercial stable, not necessarily specific to this nonprofit organization. But anyways, um, because there were concerns raised at the Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting, we suggested that the applicant hold a community meeting to provide information on their organization to some of the neighbors who were concerned. That way they would have an opportunity to get together and voice concerns and questions. Staff has received 10 comments from the public. One was from a Ward 2 Neighborhood Advisory Board member who is just expressing some concerns about the project. Two comments were in opposition. One was in the, within the 750 feet, you can see there, and one was a, a fair distance away. Um, we also received seven comments in support of this application, with one being that neighbor to the south, the two adjacent neighbors at their existing facility, and then some other ones which were provided to the Planning Commission. On the board are the conditional use permit findings. Staff does recommend approval of this subject to all of the conditions listed in the staff report, all 21 conditions listed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation. The recommended motion is on the screen and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll come back to the commission for disclosures. We'll start with Commissioner Gower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Familiar with the site, received and read the emails. Commissioner Munoz, same disclosures. Commissioner Dracula, same disclosures, and also spoke with a neighbor myself after their nap. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, familiar with the site and received and read emails. Commissioner Valto, same disclosures. Um, Michelle, I have a couple of requests to speak forms. Do we have any other requests to speak forms? Um, correspondence was received. That was forwarded to the Planning Commission and has been entered into the record. There is a voicemail 
So if you'd like to hear that first. We yes, can. please. Okay, we'll do that now. Hello, I'm calling about uh, December, December 8th. City Council meeting, Planning Commission meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. regarding 6505 Bondi Lane in Reno. I want to uh, state that I live directly next door at 5825 Bondi Lane and and I'm entirely in support of the Center for Adaptive Writing program, which is agenda 6.3 tomorrow evening. <clears throat> I know it is a valuable service to the community. I've watched them work with portions of the community. I've been to the place that they currently operate at. It is kept neat as a pin. Uh, I used to own the barn that they want to, they want you to grant the permit to 6505 Bondi Lane. This is Victoria Meyer. And I can't think of a better use than for the car program to, uh, be permitted to use that facility. Um, I ha share the border with them, the property line, and do not expect any impact at all. These are two and a half acre and above horse properties. It's a horse community. Uh, if you count up all the horses in the direct vicinity, there's probably 30 within a uh, 2,000 foot range, 3,000 feet. So. Uh, I do hope that the Planning Commission and the City Council and whoever is involved in the permitting process will give this a stamp of approval. Uh, I think it's the highest and best use of the property. It is a 12-stall barn with capacity for quite a few more horses uh, with an indoor riding arena and an outdoor arena. And uh, what other use do we want for a big barn like that? We certainly don't want it going in a commercial direction. Uh, a few years ago, I worked hard to preserve uh, our horse-like qualities in that neighborhood. And uh, I am very confident in these people to have very little impact of significant, no, no significant impact uh, to the neighbors. And I am one of them. And I, I do hope that we can help preserve the wonderful horse quality to this neighborhood. Hope you approved. Uh, I wish I could be there tomorrow night, but I am I am far away, so I won't be able to. But I would be there if I could. Thank you. Look forward to the positive outcome. That's it for voicemails. Um, okay. It doesn't uh, appear to um, nobody on Zoom has raised their hand, so I think we're good there. Okay, great. We'll have some requests to speak forms. Uh, Laura Tedesco. Hi, my name's Laura Tedesco, 2040 Meadowview, out in that same similar area. I'm also a board member, I'm the treasurer, and as Scott um, mentioned, if we could operate prior to finishing all the improvements and getting finals on everything with the current construction atmosphere, the inability to get people to show up to do the work. Um, I'm also a contractor. We struggle with this constantly and the delays could be immeasurable. <laughs> anyway, um, support the program. It's needed in our community. We're not expanding anything on there, basically cleaning up the property with you know, pavement and certain improvements. There's no expansion to this, and uh, I do hope that you see it and see the need and support us. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Carolyn Hooper. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carolyn Hooper. Um, as my husband introduced me earlier, I'm a veteran and also a co-director of the Veterans Program. Um, I actually said I didn't want to speak, but, but that's okay, I will. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is a really valuable program for our community. And I, and I cannot begin to tell you, I've been involved with it for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm also a, an instructor for therapeutic writing. I'm currently going through the credentialing process. And the joy and the power that these ha horses have with, with these children and these adults just cannot be understated. And we have struggled with those really cold days or the days it snows and you can't use the arena, the outdoor arena, because the footing's not good and it's not safe. And as my husband mentioned earlier, that requires us to say, we can't have the classes today and we have to call it off. And it's not even about what it brings to the center as far as you know our budgets and whatever, because we don't make a whole lot of money off of, I mean, we're free to veterans and, we, and we, people hardly pay to come and work there. We're mostly donations and grants that fund us. Um, but when those days happen, the impact is on, is on this a community that is within the Reno area. And you, you have the opportunity to really help us help them by allowing us to get into this facility. So um, again, I didn't mean to speak, so excuse me if I'm all red, but thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you for your, your comments, and I apologize for putting you on the spot. Um, we have a, Christine Perry submitted a form that says that she does not wish to speak a make a statement but is in favor. Christine, would you like to speak? I'm good, just just to support. This is an amazing program. Um, I'm a volunteer with the program. You need to get and up. And I encourage uh, approval. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else in the public like to speak on this item? Yes. Yes, sir. Clay Toromo, I live at 990 Del Monte. I am the neighbor that is directly adjacent and would have loved to meet these people, wasn't invited or missed if I was invited to any community opportunity to speak before this. I did get the yellow card though and came tonight. A um, Couple things I wanted to just add to what was said. There was a discussion of the buffer, the landscaping buffer, that's on my property. I own that, so I'm, to perhaps assume that that now changes what I can or can't do with my property. I need a little clarification on that. The program and what they favor, what they want to do with it is great. And I do know I moved in next to a horse barn. And so I'm not unaware of that situation. The comment that it's a horse community was true. It's now Ranchera, Ranchera Village, Bondi Lane neighborhood, um, been changed in terms of its plan for one acre home sites, um, and there's my home on the property. I have planned to build another home on the property. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a reasonable use for the property as it is. I just wanna point out that what that neighborhood was and what it's becoming are two different things, and it's, it's happening very rapidly. It's, as I said, the Ranchera Village is maybe 100, 150 feet from here. So if you look at it on the map, there's more going on than was um, kind of mentioned in this. I'm just concerned about the distance from my property of the manure, specifically, and they did address that, and that it is on my, <laughs> facing my property, and getting a little bit more information about what they're doing. Great organization, and my granddaughters are Girl Scouts and will probably be there riding, so I'm not opposed to their use, but I am concerned about its immediate adjacency to residential, including mine. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Would you please pull out a uh, request to speak form? Thank you. Okay, would anyone else in the public like to speak on this item? Sure. Um, hello, my name is Bryn Santos. I am a volunteer at Center for Adaptive Riding and a resident of a neighbor close to Bondi Lane. I am also a horsewoman and competitor. The ability to volunteer and help the riders in this program is life-changing. The lessons are planned, supervised, and controlled. The horses are kind and well cared for. The grounds are kept clean and maintained. I've been lucky enough to see and ride at some premier equestrian facilities all over the U.S. I feel very confident in saying the Center for Adaptive Riding is a premier program. 
Please approve the conditional use permit. We need this program to stay in our community. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you Thank for you. your comments. Could you fill out a comment card, please? Okay, any further comments? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Come back to the commission for discussion. Or questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll start, please. Sure. Um, this is going to be for the applicant. Um, just a quick question, and I, I, I heard it say several times um, that you guys are uh, grant based, are um, you make money through donations. Would being limited to only being able to do one large event with 100 people or less once a year restrict or make that more difficult for you? This is Nikki Landa with Center for Adaptive Writing. Um, no, we currently we don't do any fundraisers or events on site. We did one last year. Um, most of our fundraisers are, are off site. Would that be something that you would be interested in doing or something that would make it easier for you if you could do that? Absolutely. Say maybe once a year, maybe quarterly or something. Yeah. Does that uh, one time a year does hinder you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. More would be beneficial for us. And um, what, what, let me word this um, to work for the neighbors as well. What would be a good number for you that wouldn't have a huge impact on the neighborhood? As far as people or times a year? Times a year. Two, two to three a year would be really helpful. Okay. Thank I don't you. foresee us having the capacity to put on more than that. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I needed. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Gower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Landa, Sorry. didn't my memory's not great, but didn't you come here a couple years ago for a similar permit for your property over off of um, sort of off of Huffaker? So the the change is specifically so you can have that indoor <laughs> use. Correct. Yeah. So Nikki Land again, um, we did get a um, special use permit for our current location we're at right now. We were trying to buy it, but with COVID, it just a lot happened. And so we were unsuccessful. So we are, we have been looking for an indoor arena for a very long time. So that's the draw to this location. Great. Thank you. I'm going to follow up with a question to staff on that. Thanks, Leah. So what happens to the special use permit on the previous property? I know this is, this sounds like it's outside the scope, but I think it gets back to a point that you brought up during your presentation. Yes, uh, for the record, Leah Brock, the entitlement runs with the land, not the applicant. So in this particular case, if they decide they're gonna move on to another facility, that parcel is now permitted as a commercial stable. However, it is limited to those conditions of approval that were approved in 2017, I believe. Okay, so there's a special use permit on the previous property for that use, and then there will be a conditional use permit on this property for a similar use as presented. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up, too, on a question that uh, um, Mr. Tramo, I believe, um, brought up with the, I'm looking at the um, aerial photograph of the property lines and it does appear that that vegetation is on his property. So I was curious to get your response to that. Yes, thanks Commissioner Gower. The, I was aware that the vegetation was located on his property. I just wanted to make sure that if that changes, if he decides he's gonna cut down all those trees, if he decides he's gonna develop that rear portion of his property, that they understand that it is on this property owner to meet the residential screening requirements if that is for any reason removed. So, uh, okay, so just to um, clarify, so the, the applicant doesn't have a responsibility to maintain the existing vegetation, they have a responsibility to maintain vegetative screening in a similar situation as it is now yes and i okay. and i realized after i after he said that that the word maintain may have been taken out of context but it was maintain as in keep screening on that side of the property okay thanks for that clarification yes thank you mr chairman thank you uh 
Uh, I have a few questions uh, for the applicant. Um, my questions are in line with kind of, I think, Commissioner Munoz's questions. I, I'm a little concerned about some of these conditions might make it difficult for you all to operate. Um, the condition that creates a cap of 15 horses, you all have 12 stalls, uh, and then you'd only be able to bring in three additional horses onto the property. Do you see that as a problem potentially in the future? Yes. So where we're at, we are currently allotted 20 horses. Oh, sorry. This is Nikki Landa for the record. Um, so 20 really would be helpful um, because that just allows us to really, you know, get different sizes horses and a, a bunch of meet the needs of our riders. Um, and that one acre lot is open. We have talked to the neighbors right on Del Monte and Bondi <coughs> about keeping horses over there if we put up shelters and they were okay with that as long as we maintained cleaning. Um, so yeah, 20 would be our ideal. And just out of curiosity, you said you have some mini horses. We do. Put multiple mini horses in a stall? Uh, we wouldn't put them together, but we do have like a paddock area where they could all go together. So. Okay. Um, I then had a question about the condition that deals with uh, evening riding. And this <laughs> is a question for you, and then I'll follow up for you, Leah. It says that uh, all commercial activity in the evening must be indoors. Do you foresee that as a problem? not be able to do any riding outside in the evenings in the summer? We would probably, um, there's no lighting out there, so it, for safety reasons, I'll be indoors. And that was, the next question I had is the condition that deals with lighting, is that something you envision in the future you may want to put in lighting around the outdoor riding facility? I think that's a great idea that, yes, we would like to, um, as long as it meets the code and we wouldn't be imposing on any neighbors. Okay. okay, thank you. I have a few questions for, for Leah. Um, so I guess my questions for you are, first, what is evening under the conditions in your mind? And second, would they be able to put in place lighting in the outdoor arena uh, under condition 10? Thank you for the questions. Uh, for the record, Leah Brock. I'm not sure about the lighting because we need a photometric plan to understand what lighting is existing. So they are capped on the number of lumens that they can have and it just depends on what they want to put in, what's existing. So that's one of the issues. And one of the issues that was raised was they were concerned about having these spotlights in the outdoor arenas at night. Um, so when I had spoken with the applicant and she said, well, she's going to keep everything indoors, we just went ahead and made that a restriction because, again, it's not just about the Center for Adaptive Writing. It's about opening this property as a commercial stable. And, yes, so evening, um, in my mind, when I created that condition, was when it gets dark. So I didn't want to cap it at 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock or 7.30, because as we all know, it's, well, I went home the other day and it was dark at 4.30. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really about that outdoor lighting that I would be most concerned about, because that is open space, uh, open space in the term of lighting can light up all those properties and there could become an issue with light trespass in the area. Understood. So I, I guess I am, um, there's a horse property relatively close by, I think it's more off Pup Acre. And they have an outdoor riding arena that has some lighting, some like lighting that looks down. I think that's common for some of the riding areas. Um, is I think you kind of got to this, but is that precluded under any of these conditions, or would they need to come forward for a permit, or is that just capped by the lumens requirement in city code? Well, right now we have the provision that any evening activities are held indoors. So if they were to put lights out there, turn them on, and start offering classes in the evening in the outdoor arenas, yes, it would be restricted by the conditions of approval. Okay. But if we, let's say that that was not a condition. Would there be another restriction that you're aware of? Yes. Um, one of the issues that we have with this particular property is because it's in the sphere of influence, and it was Washoe County, and then we took it in under our interlocal agreement. Finding out what's actually there, what's permitted, and what's existing has been almost impossible. Um, at this point, we're not, we can show that the 
indoor riding arena was there prior to like 1991, but we actually have no idea how long it's been there. So we just don't have an idea about what's existing for lighting right now. That's why we're requiring that photometric plan. So if we took out the condition about only being able to do indoor activities in the evening, they would still be precluded because they would have to submit that, that photometric plan. And should that photometric plan come back and say that they're over their lumen count, then yes, they would not be allowed to install lights or they'd have to change the fixtures to something with less lumens. Okay. Okay. Um... Did you have any thoughts on a request to, I guess, expedite their operations? Is there any way to do that under the code? Not necessarily, and I don't necessarily know that it's under the purview of the commission to do so because we have Washoe County Health Department who has to review and approve permits. The fire department is who's requiring that paved access. Um, there may be some things that we could potentially do to work with them, but... I, I don't necessarily know what that would be under Reno Municipal Code. Um, when they did send that request to me, I did uh, move that up the chain and ask if that was something that we would normally allow, if we would allow them to operate prior to receiving the permits, converting things from residential to commercial, adding sprinklers, all of that kind of stuff, um, especially that ADA restroom, ADA parking, all of those things. And uh, we, we staff decided that that would not be okay also because of Reno Fire Department and Washoe County Health Department needing to sign off on that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, can I follow up with Leah to your question regarding the number of horses? And I think it's a good question. And if I could just ask how you arrived at the number of horses and it you talked about if there's a decrease in the area, then the horses would decrease too. Is there a, a formula there that we should be thinking about? I didn't use any particular formula to come up with the number of horses. I asked the applicant what the maximum number of horses would be, and they said 15. So I put down that it would be 15. Um, I worked on another application that was similar to this back in my previous jurisdiction where they reduced the acreage and all of a sudden we had 40 horses on one acre. So I'm cognizant of that potentially becoming an issue. While this is located in a 2.5 acre area right now, as we all know, things are changing. This is a permanent entitlement. My thought was that if that got changed to something later, they would still be allowed to have X amount of horses, 15 in this case, even if it got cut to, into like a 10,000 square foot parcel so the formula that I simply used was you know 15 horses on 3.5 acres comes out to about one horse every 10,000 square feet um, of course it is under the purview of this commission to raise that number or lower that number as as you feel necessary from your perspective Leah looking at the project it would increasing the number to 20 create any additional concerns from an adjacency perspective or any other compatibility concerns? My only concern with it would be that throughout this entire process, we have talked about 15 horses. When we went to the neighborhood advisory board meeting, when they held their community meeting, um, and the number of horses was a concern that was brought up by the public on this case. So it would just, my, my only concern would be that we've talked about 15 horses this whole time and now we're raising it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And probably a um, question for the applicant on this. Just in, to Leah's point about the, the size of this, what is the current size of the property that you're at now off of Huffaker? Um, um, our primary operations take part on two and a half acres, and then there's five acres of pasture. Okay. That's the, and the pasture is just... There's no activities on it. It's just Correct. Just turn out. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Discussion? So I'll start, Mr. Chair. So this is it's interesting. Um, appreciate the discussion we've had tonight. I, I do, like Commissioner Gower, I think we've actually seen 
these, this is the third time, I think, because it was, was this something that was looked at at Horseman's Park as well. So I think this is the third time <laughs> that they've been before us. Um, and, and every time I'm always very appreciative of what you do. And I think, you know, it's a fantastic program and, um, and appreciate that. I think on this particular site, it's interesting because I also remember uh, all of the activities that our voicemail um, alluded to when we had some development on Bondi Lane previously. And there was an awful lot of discussion about this being a, a horse area, the large lots and lots of horses that were out there. And so my initial thought when this came through is, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what we were looking at five years ago or whenever this came through. And so to me, the the compatibility, even with it moving to, uh, I should say, the, the compatibility of a horse-centric commercial function is perfect for this location. Um, I appreciate a lot of the concerns, um, and I think the, the issues that have been brought up with respect to um, some of the questions that you had with respect to the number of horses, with respect to the number of activities, with respect to uh, the lighting, I think are all in a direct response to uh, the fact that this is a change to a commercial and trying to maintain that. And so my initial thought is we've got a request before us that meets and exceeds what this um, function currently has. Their goals may be beyond that, but for the current operations, what is conditioned um, will work and exceed what they have currently. And in my mind, I think that's appropriate because there's always an opportunity if this continues to grow and expand, which I honestly and truly hope it does, there is an opportunity to come back with you know, a record of uh, a, you know, 12 months, 18 months, two years of operation there and ask for some of these things to say, hey, we've operated, we'd like to increase, uh, we'd like to light the area and we've got all of these things. So um, I am in favor of the project, and uh, but I'm in favor of the project as it's currently conditioned, knowing that there is the opportunity to expand upon that should they develop. So um, those are my comments. I appreciate the time. Commissioner Munoz. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I, I I agree with you on most of the things right there, and I think I think that's uh, a great way to look at this. And I, I believe the city has done a great job to set this up. At the same point, I think it's a uh, in favor for what they're asking, in favor for the city, because I believe this is a great project and a great uh, service that they provide to the community for our veterans, for uh, for our, uh, special needs here in town. I think it's amazing. So. With that being said, I think the only thing I would like to clean up is the language for evening and change that to either dusk or sunset and to not give them 500 events a year, but just open it up to four because I believe that being able to hold fundraisers and things there more than one a year can help them grow this program that could help it move forward. So that would be the only difference that I would have in everything that you said. So thank you, Mr. Chair. The I, yes to everything. I think the uh, the only thing I want to plug here is the potential of trying of giving more horses, and the reason being is if you have a twelve horse stalls, and then you have riders coming in that have their own horses, it makes it very difficult for you to uh, have them like you to time them appropriately so you don't have more than fifteen horses. I'm very concerned about that. And given that they said they already have 20 horses at their current facility and their current facility is very similarly sized, I think it was actually smaller uh, than, the, than the new facility, I'm not hesitant with giving them more horses. I don't, I don't think, I think you're right based on some of my questions where I don't, I'm not advocating for us putting a condition allowing them to have outdoor lighting right now. I think that's something that they can kind of come back and figure out in the future, assuming there's a track record. But the events portion with a reasonable limit and the horses, I think are important to set them up for success given how important of a program this is. I wouldn't want to over condition the project in a way that makes it so they can't succeed at their highest level. Just as a point of clarification, I believe we heard this evening that they actually have currently 11 horses. They have a special use mm -hmm. permit that allows them up to 20. 
So that's the that's the the difference there. So that was my point that fifteen is an extension of what is currently <coughs> there, um, and it but it's a it is to your point less than what they're currently operating under. So, but I I, I appreciate the point, and Commissioner Munoz, I appreciate your point too. I would wait to hear exactly how that would be worded before I could throw my support behind it, but I think that's the question. Um, well, I, I would be happy to make a motion. It sounds like we have kind of summary differing opinions. Is there a... Say, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm willing to make a motion, but I'm not the one that has modifications to it. So I would defer to other members of the commission that would, would want to do that, and then we could have a discussion about those specific items. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, Commissioner Munoz, would you like to make a motion? And no, actually, I'm going to throw this back to you since I, I do agree with the 20 horses. I, I think that's reasonable, um, and it's one step above my... <laughs> My addition to be so I think you'd be perfect to make a motion for this. Uh, okay, I don't think I can. Uh, fair. Oh. Um, would uh, so maybe if I were to tell you what I think would be a good motion. Sounds perfect. Um, yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Director. Sorry. Uh, and just for a point of a clarification too, because we covered it kind of a while ago and we've discussed a lot in regards to the applicant's request for. Uh, starting business before are the conditions of matter. We do we want to have a discussion around that at all? I, I guess I don't have a <coughs> strong sense of where we should land on that. I mean, I understand what they're going through uh, with contracting and all that. It sounds like they've got a lot of work to go before they can open up. Um, but I'm not even convinced that we have that ability to yeah do that. So I just wanted that to be out as a discussion piece. I that was my impression based on Leah's answer. I, I don't know if. Right. Uh, Anyone else would like to weigh in, potentially Carl or Jason? Yeah, I, I thought that you would probably allow them to open and then condition uh, that all of the improvements that Leah had in, in her uh, staff report, that you'd give them you know, three months or six months to complete all those, uh, like the parking lot and some of that other stuff. OK, that makes sense. Does that make sense, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair? Can I can I weigh in it from a different perspective? I think there's a there's a, a certificate of occupancy issue when you change it to a commercial use that is governed that is outside our purview um, with respect to as Leah pointed out, um, public the uh, Washington County Health Department and the City of Reno Fire, they can grant a temporary CFO based upon those items, but that's something that's handled. Uh, through uh, basically the, the permitting rather than the entitlement. And Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, I mean, we can certainly encourage that, but these are entities that are outside of community development that are making these, these um, requests. So I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of it, but there is a process through these other entities that, that we have to go through. That, that is correct. Uh, Jason Garcia, Labu, planning manager for the record. Um, through the building permit process, the site plan improvements, landscaping improvements, and other odds and ends will be taken care of. And there is a degree of flexibility that staff can do working with some of that prior to certificate of occupancy and do a partial uh, final and things like that. So we can definitely work with the applicant, but as Leah kind of mentioned, um, there are some things that were tied on with ADA um, improvements, fire safety improvements, um, any kind of life safety improvements. But we can address those during the building permit phase. Thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure we had the discussion and it was some point of clarity for him. So it looks like you guys will be able to communicate about that. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, Commissioner Munoz, uh, would you be interested in making a motion upon compliance with the applicable findings that moves to approve? the conditional use permit subject to the conditions listed in the staff report, except that condition 16 would be modified to allow for 20 horses uh, maximum, and that condition 15 would be 
uh, modified to allow for events up to three times per year, and that the condition 14 that deals with evening would be modified to um, clarify that evening instead means sunset. Yes. And would you be able to make all the findings? Yes. I, I can actually redo that if, you need, if we need to. If not, I'd like to make that the motion. Perfect. Yeah. We have a motion. Okay. And that would be my motion. Okay. We have a motion. Uh, well, let me, let me, let's make it more, a little more official than. Sure. <laughs> the case number of LDC 23-00011, Center for Adaptive Writing. Based on compliance with the applicable findings, I move to approve the conditional use permit subject to con the conditions listed in the staff report with the changes for 14, 15, and 16. That's good. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second or, or discussion? Commissioner Dracula, it's all second, but I know we're going to have a discussion. Uh, notably, Commissioner Johnson's got a, a lot of great points there. I guess where I land as a commissioner is I see a little tiny piece of red tape we can cut, so I'm happy with going forward. It seems like it's going to save time uh, and help them be more successful moving forward. So, you know, helping a small business, uh, we're really someone who's helping a lot of people. So that's where I land on that. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to weigh in on the discussion. I think, Commissioner Dracula, to your point, is very well taken in, in looking forward. The, the, the concern that I have is they, they didn't ask us that. They came forward with a proposal that was asking for a certain thing. And to Commissioner Johnson's point, we, we have a, a process that if the business is successful, then there's a modification to the use permit. And the concern that I have too is that the project was proposed in terms of adjacency a certain way with certain parameters and we're changing those parameters. So I, I'm conflicted on the, the red tape comment relative to the the duty that we have to the surrounding property owners and what we have um, articulated to them as a city with this proposal. So I'd like to just say that that's where I'm at with my thought process. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm not quite, I'm not sure I'm prepared to support the motion as stated. Uh, Commissioner Gower, I think I, um, I understand that we were not, necessarily asked and some of this was us drawing it out but I think uh, I would see this differently if there were an applicant representative that were significantly experienced in the planning process and going through the process I, I think Leah did a great job working with the applicant and the city staff always does a great job trying to navigate the varying interests but I could envision a situation where an applicant might perceive that what they worked out with city staff is what they need to present and stick to and that's why i'm a little more sympathetic or a little more open to kind of uh suggesting some different conditions if i think it'll improve the project if i thought that anything that was being proposed was going to be detrimental to the neighbors I, or more detrimental to the neighbors than is acceptable in this area which is horse property across from ranchera there's riding facilities everywhere um I'd be more in line with what you're saying, but I I see this as, a, as an overwhelming need, and it's nice to give them a new home where they can start uh, putting this uh, facility in place and not have to worry uh, about potentially having to move again, hopefully. I don't disagree with anything that you said. The, the one piece that you didn't mention that I'm concerned about and I want, I want us to be thinking about in our decision when we put these conditions in place that this runs with the property beyond this applicant. So there could be a, a use that is similar but quite a bit different that could supersede this use in the future. And then I would put that back on 
on my fellow commissioners and you, Mr. Chairman, if you would be comfortable with that, um, with the same conditions for a use that is just strictly, um, you know, a commercial equestrian facility. And I think there are, so just to, to cat touch on that, because I was thinking about that earlier, this, this indoor riding arena is, um, has its own constraints that prevent this from being used as a huge, like jumping facility. It's, too, it's difficult to do those types of events inside this arena because it's too low. So you can't have a really extensive training facility for horse riding. And this type of facility is, is really well catered for this specific use. And I think that's the difference you see in these types of arenas versus some of the other arenas that might be larger. So I, I'm not as concerned about the use going with the land because they'd have to tear down the building and put in place something much larger or they'd have to pivot to an outdoor facility which would go to some of our concerns and some of the other conditions. Um, so if it looks different, I'd be a little more concerned about that. But I think this is uniquely attuned for this type of facility, for this type of use. Thank you for the, the dialogue. I appreciate that. I'd welcome Commissioner Johnson to weigh in too. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the to the three modifications, um, I 100% support the modification to 14 to clarify the the you know sunset requirement. I think that is vital. Um, to number 15, the the one about the special events, um, I do have some issue with that. I mean, there's a requirement for a special activity permit. Um, it does allow it, and and maybe there's a there's a different ground here. It, it basically, it talks about an event over 50 people requires that um, and a maximum. So it's basically a minimum, anything over 50 requires a permit with a maximum of 100 and it's limited to one event per year. Um, to me, I think that is appropriate for now. I don't know that, you know, they've, they've stated, you know, that they're not currently having any events there. Um, we're giving the opportunity to do an event there, which is one more event than they're currently doing on site. Um, I think that, again, to my point, is is an extension of what they have. So I, I do have an issue with, with that. Um, and then I think the one about the horses, this is an interesting point to Commissioner Gower's discussion about um, what has been presented up to this point. Um, I believe, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's some administrative thing, and I may be thinking about a PUD, but there's like a 10% flex in terms of some things, especially with, a, with um, things that come in where you can increase or decrease within that 10%, and it doesn't need to come back and change what we're doing. And, and I don't know if it's specific to this, but that's kind of the way that I've been thinking about sort of areas from tentative maps to final maps. There's a little bit of flexibility that happens there that can be handled administratively. Am I in the right ballpark, Jason, even if I'm not hitting this the right way. Um, yes, um, we, tip, we typically have something called a minor modification process too, where we can slightly modify um, within that scope if it doesn't materially change or affect the conditions of approval. Okay. And so th that's a process that the applicant apply th can apply through. It's an administrative process that we typically review when we look at that. Okay, because I, I think where I was going and whether that's the specific terminology or not, um, you know, a 10% change from what we see here is something that can happen sort of without a public hearing. It just, it sort of happens internally. So what is being proposed here is, you know, 25% more um, to go from 15 to, to 20. Um, and I think that's above and beyond what would be expected for something that's presented to the NAB, that's presented at a neighborhood meeting, that's presented in all of the documentation that's that's announced that the, the number is going to be 15. If that number bumps to 16, that's in that realm. 17, okay, we've gone a little bit beyond. We're, 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 it's a 25% increase in the number of horses <laughs> from what has been presented. And so while I'm sensitive to the fact that that's what they have currently, that's not what was asked for in this application. Um, and the number that they have is still an increase over what's what's current. So um, I, like Commissioner Gower, am not opposed in concept to either of these changes. I just don't feel comfortable making them from the dais as something that were not specifically requested, 
specifically discussed at all of the opportunities that the city presents for these to be discussed, but is then decided here in a public hearing and you know uh, moves forward without many of the neighbors who receive their cards they don't necessarily they're not necessarily watching or doing what we're doing here so uh, i i go back to to my initial point that i think everything that's in here is an increase or at least a, a maintaining of what is currently in place and i think that it's in keeping with what we're being asked for and i think that you know were we to just push this forward, it meets and exceeds what they currently have in need and would get them going on their way. To, to take beyond that, I'm just I'm uncomfortable with doing that as a, a decision of this body beyond what's already been publicly noticed and discussed. So I support it, but I can't support it from a motion without it having been something that was actually requested to us. Mr. Chair. Um, listening to to both Commissioner Gower and Commissioner Johnson, completely understand what they're saying, and I could see from their point if we had just grabbed a number and said, "Hey, let's give them twenty horses. Hey, let's give them three events. Hey, let's let's just do stuff for them," which was was not the purpose, and that's why I specifically asked what would make you more successful and make this a little bit easier, because I do see the conditions as extremely restraining. And I understand why. I understand we don't want this to turn into, for whatever reason, they leave and it becomes a commercial uh, horse training property for the PBR to come in and do a bull riding training facility, something. Like, I, and I don't think that this property is capable of holding something like that. It's just not. I don't believe two more events with 100 people, we're talking 300 people in a year, is um, going to overwhelm the neighborhood by any means. Um, I don't believe five more horses, and, and I did grow up with horses. My wife was a barrel racer for years, so I do have some history with horses. I'm not speaking out of uh, context here, so I do understand five more horses is not detrimental to a property that size by any means. It's not a big deal. Um, so coming from uh, a place of knowledge from this background um, and the special events, which I, I don't see as, as that much of a burden on the community. I don't think it's too much to uh, to change the conditions of approval. That's why I was able to make those findings and go that route. Thank you. Thank you. I um I, I appreciate your y'all's perspective. I, I think I I agree with Commissioner Munoz on this, but I I understand where you're coming from, and that means it ultimately comes down to Commissioner Draculich. Um, we we should do a Roll call vote. Do you want me to start now? Um, one point, point is good, just so I understand. I mean, I, I think we all, all five commissioners, you know, we're seeing what the staff has presented and outside of changing uh, condition number 14 that we all in agreement and want to support this organization, right? I mean, now I'm struggling with are we going to flub this and put them in a bad spot if we can't kind of come to terms? Obviously, I think I know where we all stand. So I guess I'm just trying to understand if this motion – only pushes three to two, where do we put the organization with that, just so I understand? That would still be an approval. Okay, understandable, okay. Are you ready for a roll call vote? Yes, please. All righty. Alex Felto? Yes. Mark Johnson? I, I have to, based on the, dis, the, the changes in the motion to stuff that wasn't presented previously, I, I can't make that judgment from the dais so as much as i support the project 100 percent, i can't support us as a body changing the conditions separate from what has been pre presented before i just don't think that's a precedent that we want to be setting here so as much as i <laughs> appreciate the project i can't support the process of the motion change so i'm going to vote no Draculich? yes gower no, and I completely echo what Commissioner Johnson said. And Mr. Chairman, I, I am frankly disappointed with the way the conversation went here and the position that um, Commissioner Johnson and I are in. I, I think it's frustrating. It should be a wholly unanimous approval with applause of this particular project. And I'm extremely frustrated to be voting against it. And I'm brutally angry. Munoz? Yes. The motion passes three to two. 
Uh, thank you, and good luck with your project. Great. We'll uh, give you some time to clear the room unless you want to enjoy the rest of the meeting. Okay, we'll move to agenda item number uh, agenda item number seven. We're going to continue. Uh, it's a uh, planning commission training series. Um, Jason is going to give us the training. Hopefully, at the next meeting. The staff is recommending, since two newer commissioners are not here, that we put that on the December twenty first meeting. So, if the commission is okay with that. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to agenda item number eight, which is the Truckee Meadows Regional Planning Liaison Report. I was going to make Sylvia do it because she was the new board member, but she's not here. So we had a meeting at the end of last month. I think there was two items on the agenda. Um, one to some of the things we heard here tonight was a, a zone change uh, up in the Washoe County portion of North Valley's, uh, an area that's a, a well-established gravel pit uh, and landscape yard that's being converted into residential use. And um, it was ultimately approved, but it was an excellent discussion about traffic uh, and development um, and ultimately was passed because the existing site has traffic now coming and going as opposed to undeveloped land. So, uh, and Commissioner Gow, I don't remember what the other one was <laughs> on the item. So um, the next meeting is actually the day after our meeting on the 21st, we have one on the second okay thank you so much uh, agenda number nine staff announcements hello commissioners Jason Garcia Labu planning manager for the record um, at our next meeting on December 21st we have one item on the agenda right now it is a master plan and zoning amendment item just so you know um, with that I did want to bring up um, staff is currently putting together a uh, training for late January to discuss, um, to both educate and discuss annexations. I know that's issues come up at the commission a number of times. Um, tonight we had two different projects that kind of deal with that. One being in the city limits and dealing with near the sphere and near Washoe County. The other, this last item, actually being outside of city limits, but being within the sphere and right across the street. So how that all plays in. Um, the kind of the expired annexation program and things like that that's going to come forward. Um, so hopefully that will be a good opportunity to both educate some of the newer commissioners and also uh, discussion and direction. So um, I wanted to mention that tonight. And then um, also just uh, update on the city council items on the December 14th agenda. The Highland project that your commission looked at, it will be there this year, senior care PUD amendment as well as the Hogue Road project has been agendized. But again, that leads to that annexation conversation. So more to come in the future of the new year. So let me know if you have any questions and happy to add any requests as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number 10, commissioner suggestions for future agenda items. Well, Jason mentioned he's gonna do a thing on the annexations and all that. So that took care of my future agenda request. Uh, great. Uh, number 11, public comment. Do we have any requests to speak for him? I do not. Anyone in the public like to speak? None. We will close public comment. Uh, number 12 is adjournment. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.